question that came up on Piazza was about speeding up training. For my mind, there's one trick that's the first thing you should always use. Any guesses on that? Increase the batch size. Now, there's a proviso for that, assuming we're using a GPU. Because if we're using a GPU, you can process more images simultaneously. And so that's going to speed it up. If you double your batch size, you're going to double your training time. Well, have your training time, which is, which is even better than doubling it. Right? So increase batch size. Now that will have some effect on the actual training that happens, right? Because you're going to have uh, less randomness. The, the larger your batch size is, the, the less different it's going to be from batch to batch to batch, right? You can imagine if you take it down to a batch size of one, that's really just pure stochastic gradient descent. And there, there's a lot of variation from one batch to the next batch, right? From one image to the next image to the next image, or one input to the next input to the next input. And clearly, at the other extreme end of the spectrum, if you're using an entire batch at a time, right, the entire training sample as your batch, then you don't have any difference from batch to batch. Right? Every epoch is the same. So there'll be some difference here. But in general, increase the batch size until you can't. Because that you're going to give you this, you know, uh, uh, you know, increase batch size by two, decreases training size, training speed by two. Uh, doubles the speed, we'll say, right? What is the limiting, yeah? I was, just, I was ask how we know. Okay, so what's the limiting factor? Something to do with the GPU. Right? I agree, something to do with the GPU. So how many cores it has could be one possibility. How many cores do GPUs have these days? Four, 64. I'm thinking you have more like, uh, I'm not done yet, but it's thousands, right? They're like 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, something like that. They're not general CPU cores, right? I can't say U core, go do this computation. U core, go do this completely different computation. Instead, this is uh, CIMD, that's what it is. So this is single instruction. multiple data. So it's like I told everyone in the room, OK, we're all going to be doing the same thing. You're working with different data, but we're all going to be first multiply these two numbers together, and then add a third number, and then do this other thing and do other thing. And we're all working kind of in lockstep, except we all have different data we're working on. All right? So these cores are much simpler, uh, which is why we can have so many of them. And this works great for stuff that can get kind of paralyzed, like matrix multiplication or things, things like that works really well. You can be doing algorithms that operate, let's say, on all the pixels of a uh, 4K image, for example. And you're just doing the same thing to each pixel. And so it, it, it does them basically all at once. So what do you run out of? Possibly cores. More likely what you run out of is memory. We need what memory needs to be stored in the GPU. That is, what's the stuff that needs to be there? That's, give me one thing that's stored in the GPU. The model. The model. And what about the model? Like the, parameters. the parameters. Right, so we get the weights. So on the GPU, we have the weights. Um, Ali, what else might we have? Right, we're going to start, we're going to be trying to do the forward pass, let's say. We got the weights, as they are right now. Um, and let's just have a reminder. Z1 equals X, W1 plus B1. W, V, we already got, right? Because that's the parameters. Right. Um, so, X is one, and then we have X, so X is? 
the data, the input, right? So we've got our input. All right. Um, well, what else might we have? Sorry. Willow, what else let me have? So we do Z1 equals XW1 plus B1, then we do what? A1 equals Z1, sorry, G of Z, G1 of Z1, and then Z2 equals A1, W2 plus B2. Is there any reason to store all this stuff? Or can we just kind of keep computing till we get to the end? Like, do we need to store A1 for any reason? In the forward pass, we don't have to. In the forward pass, we could just sort of reuse, take our input, call it A0, and then kind of use that same, do this computation, and then store that in A, reuse that space for A1, and then reuse that space for A2. But when you get to backward propagation, right, remember in our back propagation, as we're going back, we need to know these activation values to move back from layer K to layer K minus 1 to K minus 2 to K minus 3 to push the gradient. So therefore, although we don't need these for the forward pass, we need them for the backward pass, and therefore we save them. So we also need all the activations. All, right. all this stuff goes on the GPU. The nice thing is if it doesn't fit, you just get a runtime error out of, out of GPU memory. So like, reduce your batch size if that's the case. Does that make sense? That's kind of what I do first thing. If I'm doing k-fold validation, I would turn off all but one fold. I would just run one fold, because right, the reason we're doing k-fold is to get a average to see kind of more what our true validation error is. But if I'm just trying stuff out, you know, I don't care whether I am 80% valid or 70% or 90%. But I do care if I'm 5 or 80, right? So I'll just run one fold, run that a lot of times until I'm getting close to where I need to be, and then turn on the k-fold to do that. Does that make sense? Similarly for number of epochs, right? You might run for a small number of epochs to begin with. See if you're kind of on the right track. Is anything happening? If nothing's happening, you didn't want to have run for 200 epochs. Maybe you could tell that by running three epochs. But in order to train faster, you either need to make each epoch run faster or run fewer epochs. Would you agree with that? What does this do? Which of those does this address, Jack? Yeah, makes each, makes each epoch run faster. What else can make each epoch run faster? Uh, Ezra. Mm-hmm. A simpler model, right? Because if you have fewer forward passes and fewer backward passes in the back propagation, that can make each each run of a mini batch faster. So that's one possibility. Yeah. Decreasing the K for K fold, yes. Uh, anything else that could make it faster? Let's, what's in a batch or in an epoch? We've got the number of mini batches. Sorry. We've got the size of a mini batch and the number of mini batches. Do we have any control over the number of mini batches once we fix a particular batch size? How? Why, how? For the image generator, you could, for the image generator, um, the, really what that's doing is changing how many training samples there are, right? And that's what you could do. You could change your training size, right? Instead of training on 50,000 inputs, train on 5,000 inputs, and that should be 10 times faster, right? So your, your total time per epoch will be smaller because you're just working with less data. Your, Potential problem, of course, is that you will overfit. Does that make sense? But until you're overfitting, it's not a problem, 
right? First, you want to get to overfitting. If you can't even get to good training loss, then why do you need more data? Why do you need more training examples, right? I can, because I can give you overfitting with one training example. Right? If I just train on one sample, it's going to pretty much memorize that sample and it's not going to uh, generalize very well. But that's a good thing to consider doing is just cut everything down until you can get a reasonable training loss, training accuracy, find that you're overfitting, and then start slowing it down. Okay? That's, those are sort of my thoughts. All right, so today what we're going to be talking about is really two things. We're finishing up architectures of convolutional neural nets, and the one we're talking about is ResNet. And then we're going to talk about how to tell what a model is doing. Right, we've got this neural network, and we really, it's pretty darn opaque. And so at least for image inputs, we have some ways that we can get some visualization from that. Okay, and so we're going to talk about that. So for ResNet, so ResNet is basically residual network. Residual, what does that mean? Error. Or uh, more colloquially, let maybe leftover, right? What's leftover? Yeah, so, right, at our house, right, our kids used to complain, oh, we're having residuals again for dinner? No, they didn't, but I could have. Anyway, so, um, so let's say we have some f of x that we're calculating. We can rewrite this as f of x equals x plus some residual. Okay, so we got some black box that takes in an x and outputs a y. Well, let's call it f of x. Right? So this is the f of x box. That's one way we can get f of x. A second way we can get f of x is we can take for some appropriate h of x, feed x into here, add that to h of x, and that's the same thing as f of x. Would you agree every f of x has such an h of x? In fact, it's pretty easy to say what it is, right? h of x is just f of x minus x. It's the difference, the residual, the delta. Wow, this is profound, huh? <laughs> However, here's the idea. If this is a layer in a neural network, we can replace a layer in a neural network with a different layer in a neural network to which we add x. Why is this handy? Well, let's think about this. It'd be nice, let's say you had a trained neural network, okay, of, of depth k. It would seem nice if you could add a couple more layers to that and that it should be able to still learn the same thing, okay? Maybe we just stick a few layers on and then we retrain from the existing weights. It should be easy for it to, to, to learn that. It'd be nice if that were easy to learn. You could just add more layers and it doesn't really hurt anything. So if we had a neural network and then we have a neural network and we add two more layers. So this is layer and this is let's say another layer. <coughs> this is trained, this is trained, 
that it'd be nice if we could now train this larger network and have it know the same thing. So if we have an x coming in here and an f of x coming out of here, right, because that's all a neural network is, it's some function of x, it'd be nice to be able to feed in x here and to be able to get out f of x here. The easiest way to do that is, we know this is, starts out learning f of x, right? What is this? If this output is f of x, so the input to these two layers is of fx, and the output of these two layers is f of x, what do these two layers compute? There's a name for such a function, right? Yeah, the identity. It's not that easy for a neural network to learn the identity function. Okay? It's possible, it's just not that easy. However, let's now make this f of x the identity function. Okay, so we're gonna go back to just this, this example. So let's say this is id, this is id, this is x plus, what does h of x become? Right, we want the output to be the identity. This is add to x whatever's in this box. What's in the box? Zero, right? Is it easy for a layer of a neural network to learn to output zero? Yeah, just like start throwing zeros, basically just shrink down every single value in some initially random matrix, right? In fact, it doesn't have to make them all go to zero. It can just start shoving stuff to be negative and let the ReLU force it to zero, right? Pretty easy. So it's easier for a neural network to learn to do zero than it is to do the identity. That's kind of uh, part of the inspiration for where this came from. Okay. So now let's go back and look at how we're going to build a neural network with residuals. Yeah. What would this be useful for having the identity function? Here's what it would be useful for. Let's say I've got a problem for which it turns out I can build this really perfect neural network that's 58 layers deep, okay? 58 is one of my um, hyperparameters, right, in the sense of how deep I make it. If I make it 60 or 65 or 68 deep instead, it'd sure be nice if it could still learn it well. One way it could learn it is if it took some of those layers and just made them identity layers and then had the 58 perfect ones still in there. So we're making it, we're gonna try and make it, we're gonna make some layers possibly optional is one way to think of it, okay? So part of what we're, part of what's really gonna be happening is the neural network is going to be learning uh, which of these layers do I actually care about and which of the layers I don't even need. Okay, I'll show that in, 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 a, in a little more detail. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a conv layer with its associated activation um, the way the ResNet actually works is it does two three by three conves. As far as receptive field is concerned, we could replace this with a five by five, right? Um, but it's 25 eighteenths more weights for that. So we're gonna just use this three by three here. And what we're gonna do is add this skip. 
So I'm going to look at a four layer um, neural net. In fact, for the moment, I'm going to make this even a little simpler. I'm not going to put two here. I'm going to just put a convolution, all right? And then I'm going to skip. And then I'm going to feed this into another convolution with a skip. If I'm going to actually add the output of the convolution to the input to the convolution, what do I know about this convolution? What do I know about the output size? Better be the same, right? These two better have the same sizes because I'm doing this pointwise addition. So therefore, I know this convolution, what do I know about its padding? Half padding, right? So if this were a problem for which we really only needed one layer, this could learn that easily. It could say, OK, we'll just make the second layer be all zeros and make the first layer do whatever we need it to do. And then it could just kind of skip past it, right, because it's doing this addition. This is a form of. I'm going to call this convolution F1 and this convolution F2, and we'll throw in another one here. We'll throw in an F3. Right. You remember in dropout, I described the fact that dropout is like having an ensemble of different neural networks, each of which uh, has some subset of the particular inputs where we have the dropout layer. So the dropout layer, every time we are putting in a mini batch, is like a new little neural network, okay? Where some of the stuff is a new neural network with brain damage, right? So we have an existing big neural network and we just add selective brain damage all over the place. So every mini batch causes a different. Uh, uh, type of brain damage, right, or a different um, amount is not quite, right, quite the right word, but we're, we're burning different brain cells, right? And then at the end, we look at, okay, what if we had all the brain cells? Basically, we combined everyone, combined this ensemble. We're going to be doing the same sort of thing here. You can think of it kind of as, as if we're removing layers. So there's a couple things I want to look at here. This is often called a skip connection because we're skipping around the associated layer or layers. Let's look at one thing. Normally, if we don't have these skip connections, if we have a deep neural network, and we're trying to train the first layer, we've got gradient that has to go through every single layer and make it all the way back, all the way to F1, right? If we have low activations or low gradient at any point along that path, then that may vanish to zero by the time we get here. One thing that these skip connections do is provide a path for gradient, right? If we look at what's the gradient for F1, for what's the derivative of the loss with respect to these weights, it's the sum of all the different paths, right? And one of the paths is here, where the derivative here is always 1. Right? So this derivative is 1, this derivative is 1, and so we can get to any place we want early in the neural network, an early layer in the neural network. 
Let me look at this in a, in a slightly different pictorial fashion. And the key thing about these, by the way, is they're deep. So ResNet has a, a lot of different flavors in terms of the depth. VGG had that. I don't know if you had noticed that, but VGG has a, a 16 depth version and a 19 deep version, and I think a couple of others sort of in that range. ResNet has, what, a 34, and I think one in the middle, I think a 101, a 154. Okay, 154 is like, that's a lot of layers. It's really hard to train all the way back to that first layer from 154 deep. And these residual networks are what allow us to do that. So let's say we have x goes to, let's say, f1. And x also skips f1. Okay, that's one uh, possibility is basically we go to F1 and then skip past everything else. Or we skip past F1 and skip past everything else, right, and we just end up as X. Or another alternative is we go to F2. That is, we skip F1. And then we could either go on from there or we could go on to F3, right? Or we could go directly to F3. So what are we missing? We're missing, so we have F3 by itself, F2, F3, F2. We need the possibilities from F1. So F1 can go to F2 and then on or also to F3 and then on. One, two, three, four, five. That doesn't seem like the right number. We should really have eight outputs here. Okay, so we missed one kind of here and here. But we really, we have eight different paths through this, right? For every one of these three layers, we can go through it or not go through it. So we have two cubed different possible paths through here. We can go through all three layers. We can go through no layers. We can go through any combination of two layers. So as we add a layer, we get double the number of possible paths. If we were to remove a particular layer, it removes half of the paths. An interesting um, paper that was done showed that you could actually take a trained ResNet and at prediction time, just disable some of the layers. Just like turn them off. And as you turn off more and more layers, the error starts to increase gradually in a very nice fashion. So showing that it can kind of support, it, it works around that um, error. Have you ever heard the term that, uh, let's see, on the internet, how does that go? Censorship is seen as, this is unfamiliar at all, a routing problem or something? That, that, that basically, information routes around missing nodes, right, on the internet. And then the same sort of thing in a ResNet, it just routes around missing layers. Uh, and most of the number of paths, right, follows this binomial distribution where there's one path that has all of the layers, and there's one path that has no layers, and most of the paths have about half the layers. Okay. And that's where most of the interesting stuff actually, actually happens. Right, let's look at an example of a network like this. But that's the basic idea of ResNet. It's really just create a residual by adding so that the, each layer is constructing the difference from what its input is to what the desired output is, rather than transforming the input to the output. Okay. 
questions on that, that key point? Jack. Two quick questions. Yep. One is, um, we basically are showing this up so that like, we can skip as many, skip or go to as many as we want, but it has to be, or we couldn't go like, the other interesting thing that this paper did is it said, actually, if we rearrange some layers, it's not so bad either, which I think is fascinating. Um, but no, the way this is hooked up is you always are moving forward. There's no backward or skipping. One other question is, I, Martin also thinks that like, maybe it's just, like, just easier like, computation-wise to do the setup this way, but how is this necessarily different than like, setting up a bunch of different like simpler models that aren't so simpler networks that aren't really as deep as this and then just seeing how well those do against or solving those things. You could do that. Uh, there are a couple problems. One is so I would imagine that prediction here is going to be quicker than predicting across different models and then averaging them together. So that's that's one thing. And then the second thing is it's kind of figuring out what the architecture of these submodels are. This, this is just sort of very simple and straightforward. You just kind of put a bunch of these residuals together, and that's it. Yeah. Can you clarify what you mean by each layer is constructing a residual? Yeah, so here's what I mean. When we have no, no skip connections, right? no residuals, And I'm going to actually rename these now to be H1, H2, and H3 to reflect those residuals, that the H's are, the, are those differences. Here, I am transforming X to something else, right? And then I take that and transform it to something else, and then take that and transform it, and I get a final output. Here, I am not transforming X, right? The transformation of X is after the plus. So what I'm actually doing is saying, take X, and add some modification to it, right? So this is tweak number one, tweak number two, tweak number three. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? All right, so let's look at the, at the ResNet model. All right, so, and the ResNet, by the way, uh, ends up beating the uh, inception we saw, the, uh, the inception V1. So it's about 3.5% error on the image net. So what we've got here is a bunch of three by th two, pairs of 3x3 three three convolutions, okay? So, uh, and each pair has a skip connection around it. I'll talk about the dotted ones in a moment. Um, but basically what those are doing is adjusting both the number of features and the size of the uh, associated image. So it sort of takes the place of a max pool. So it starts out as a 7 by 7 with a pooling, but then it just has a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of these. Okay. So it's even less... Um, the VGG was sort of carefully chosen, if you look back at that one, you know, of having particular convolutions of particular sizes within max pools of certain sizes. And this one is just almost like blindly throw a bunch of these residual blocks out there and go to town. Okay. We have, uh, let me pull in a a little bit of this. All right, so the first thing it does is it's just reducing the spatial dimension. So this is dividing the spatial dimension by two, and there's another spatial dimension dividing by two. We're going to have to talk about how that works in a moment. And then, all right, so again, these dotted lines are these reducing the spatial dimensions. And as we reduce the spatial dimensions, as is common, we do increase the number of features. So that by the end, we have 512 different features. Yeah. Uh, is the like, dash or a slash 
the, the slash two means we're cutting our size by half. Okay. So our, our, our input size turns from maybe 224 by 224 to 112 by 112. We would normally have done that with a max pool. We're going to do something different because all we have here is convolutions. Okay? And then at the very end, we do an average pool. So this is fairly similar to the inception model where we don't have a lot of fully connected layers here. We just do one average pool and then shoot that into your 1,000 outputs. Questions before I talk about the, the downsampling, the reducing the uh, size, yeah. Why do the sizes of these networks, 34, 101, and 154? Why not like 50, 100, and 150? Uh, well, we're, ca we're counting this one. So that's one, which is probably why we're not getting up as a, as a um, and then we also have at the beginning two here. So let's just think about that. That's three. We think the rest would be divisible by two. Yeah, you'd think it'd be some k times two plus a little at the beginning and a little at the end. And so I think we'd have to look at the exact structure of it to see why. Yeah. Well, that shouldn't matter because we're just talking about how many layers there are. And the fact that some are divided by two and some not, I'm not sure whether that would make a difference. But tell me, tell me what you're thinking. Just that that would add like a, a weird number to it because it divides it by two three times, right? Oh, I see. So if you're going to divide by, that's a possibility. If you're going to divide, the other thing you could look at though is each of these pairs. You could just say I'm going to just say one of them is a uh, divide by two. I, I could repurpose existing ones to make them be divide by two ones. I'm thinking, and the other thing I guess is they still take two layers for that. You were going to say. Thirty-four minus this one and minus the first one. Yeah, that kind of sounds good. It's certainly at least a multiple of two. Um, yeah, that doesn't work very well with one one. We can't subtract two and get a multiple. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, okay. So let's talk about the downsampling. If we're not going to do a max pool, how can we go from I don't know 100 by 100 input? by uh, 64 to 50 by 50, not to scale, by 128. And we're not allowed to use max pool or average pool. No pooling. What if it was an option? Uh, I mean, in fact, I'll, I will say, what do we have left? What else do we know how to do? Yeah, we have convolutions. We've got to do a convolution. And in fact, we have to do a 3 by 3 convolution. So we know there's going to be a 3 by 3 convolution. Uh, what's the depth of it going to be? 64, because it's got to match the input. How many of them are we going to have? Correct, 128. And we can control the pad and the stride. And that's it, right? So the pad and the stride, we normally use a stride of one and a pad of half padding, which is equivalent to one. If we use a stride of two, we'll be ripping through that image twice as fast, which means we'll have half as many outputs, right? So that's what we'll do, stride of two, pad of one, which is half padding. Does that make sense? So we'll be, we'll be centered on every other pixel, right? We'll still be using as input all of the pixels, but we'll only be centered on every pixel. So that's how we do the sampling there, the downsampling. At least that's how we do part of it. 
right? Let's say this is the down sample here. Let's just make this bigger. So we have our H1, we have our X coming in. Our X coming in is 100 by 100. By 64, definitely not to scale. We know what's coming out here is what size, according to what we just did over there? 50 by, 50 by 50 by 128. And we're about to send this through a plus. So therefore, we have our x going over here. Are we allowed to just add our x here to our x here? They're just the wrong shapes, right? 100 by 100 by 64, we can't add to 50 by 50 by 128. So we've actually got to do some, it's called a projection here. We've got to do some computation on this in order to get it in the right format. But we kind of want to do as little as possible because we want it to stay sort of X-ish. Right? We want most of any difference to happen in here. So the two things we know we have to do are reduce the size and increase the channel. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a one by one convolution. Because a two by two or a three by three takes a bunch of pixels and manipulates them together. And we want to do as little manipulation as possible. So we're going to just do a one by one. With this one by one convolution, if we want to go from 100 by 100 to 50 by 50, what's the stride? It's got to be two, right? So we skip every other pixel. So we're actually going to be just ignoring every other one out of, we're going to be ignoring three out of every four pixels. We'll be thrown away. Yes? No padding, since we're doing, yeah. There's exactly, there's no pad, there's never any need for padding because it never extends over the edge. And we're going to have this one by one by, what's the depth here for this convolution? 64, good. And how many of them are we going to have? 128 of them. So basically what we're going to be taking is a core sample here, right? We're just drilling through one particular pixel, getting all the 64 values, doing this linear combination of the 64 values to turn them into 128 values. I'm sorry, I take that back. We're going to do this linear combination of 64 values to get one value. And then we'll do that with different such convolutions 128 times. And that will give us one particular output core. And then we'll add them together. So we're using the, like, the identity of it. There's still, there's still some training being done. There is still some training being done only when we're downsampling so that it can figure out basically how do you turn 64 things into 128 things. Well, they're, they're features of locations, yeah. yes. So it just seems weird that we're, we're ignoring. Well, when we downsample, right, when we're shrinking, there's some sort of ignoring or compression or something taking place. And the closest you can come to an identity, I think, would be just subsampling, just picking particular samples, right? Let's say you were going from 100 by 100 by 64 to 50 by 50 by 64. You wouldn't need this guy, right? You would just basically say, you could say, take every other pixel. Yeah. And that would maintain the identityness, I think, closer than averaging every four pixels, for example. Maybe. So. so not quite maintaining the identity, but doing something very simple. And yes, throwing away data. That's it for ResNets. Uh, the last picture I wanted to show you actually is, and it just kind of goes long. 
34, 50, 101, 152. C34, 50, I lost that one, 101, and I got this one wrong by two. But off by two is not bad. Um, there are some bottleneck layers I'm not going to even bother talking about. Okay, but there's basically some ways to shrink the weights uh, of some of these convolutions. Yeah. Right. The activation. I am 98% sure is before the plussing. Okay. So that you could then just completely carry stuff back without just maintaining the uh, partial derivatives as one all the way back, which you couldn't necessarily do if you had the really. Um, yeah, you would choose a smaller one, you don't have the mini. A bigger. A, a bigger concern would be how long does it take to train and also how much memory does your GPU have, right? Some GPUs may not have enough memory to have a reasonable batch size with 154 depth. Yeah, Jack. Um, so when we're doing this like projection convolutions and stuff, are we adjusting the weights for that too when we're doing so that? These are weights, right? Right in here, these cubes. So this will be learned by the network okay. what these values are. Is that necessarily like it's okay that it's doing that? Because we, again, we don't want it to basically be like X. We don't want it to be something that's different. We don't really want to be changing it. So maybe is it going to learn that like it's going to, it's going to learn how to the best way to like have it be like as close to X as possible? Or like what, what, what is it? What it, it yeah, that's a good question. And this is all part of, you know, how do neural nets learn and what do they learn? They learn what works for them is all I can really say. Um, um, it has no idea that X is what it should be coming out here. We're just trying to, um, without the projections, clearly we're forcing it to just maintain an identity. And without it, we're saying there's, we are restricting what you could do to it. You can only look at a single core. You can't look at any surrounding pixels. Uh, all you could do is turn 64 things into 128 things. So, or rather, 64 into one, 64 into another, 64 into another, 128 times. All right. Uh, human performance, I think I mentioned this, basically 5%. So we are better than human performance, and that's why this is no longer a challenge. Right? The data, the ImageNet uh, data set is still there, but just the categories are not that useful anymore. I think I mentioned the other day what else, what, what is now used for um, trying to predict? Yeah, bounding boxes, right? It's a, it's a cat, and it's there, right? So that's a, a harder problem, of course. Or even harder might be, here's a picture with a bunch of things in it, you know? Put a bounding box around the man and the motorcycle the man is standing on and the car next to it and the tree, okay? And as far as human performance, like, Boy, how do we tell the difference in the image net whether between the Siberian husky and the Eskimo dog? Is there more snow in Siberia such that Siberian huskies are more likely to be in snow? Is that a useful piece of information to have? Maybe. Um, yeah, I have no idea what the differentiating features are. I guess you would go look at the American Kennel Club, you know, breed descriptions to look at what are the differences supposed to be between them, and then you could fine tune on that. The neural networks, of course, don't get fed in AKC uh, information. Any questions on architectures of CNNs? All right, so what we're going to talk about now is visualizing convolutional neural networks, kind of what they're doing. And here's the first thing we're going to look at. Let me actually show you the result, and then we'll look at how we get there. So let's say we've got a neural net um, works on ImageNet, and I feed in a novel image. So I'm going to feed in this image here, right? What do you say the classification is? Anyone? 
Elephants, yeah, it doesn't do plurals, so elephant. Was African or Indian? Yeah, no, I'm asking you, African or Indian? Oh, Yeah, because those are two different labels, I believe. Okay, good. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, so we've got this. Here's kind of what we'd like to know. Hey, neural net that's trained, what part of this whole image are you actually using to figure out it's an elephant? What's the important part here? Would we guess it's this part here? I, I would hope not. I mean, maybe, oh yes, that's Indian grass, not African grass. Uh, but I doubt it, right? But probably like tails and trunks and ears and tusks all would enter into this. Okay, they'd be the most important things. So what we want to do is construct, and I'm just skipping all the code here for a moment, a heat map. This heat map would say, hey, of the image you gave me, here's the important part. So yellow is like the most important part and you know, lighter blue and so on. This is a heat map. Kind of hard to understand right now. But if I feed that heat map on top of our original image, and I kind of get to see what is important. Well, the most important thing is this sucker's face, right? The baby's face there and maybe its ear. The end of its trunk doesn't matter that much, actually. But it's kind of this, this whole area here and some up here and that trunk seems to matter. That's what it's focusing on. And it's focusing some, actually, on this stuff down here, but not this area here, just like I said. Yes. So well. when you're saying it matters, is, are you comparing it to other elephant images? Like, where are you getting what matters the most? So we're going to figure out what matters. But wouldn't it be neat to just know the neural network happens to think for this image, the shiny stuff is what matters, right? The, the part we've, we, we have noted. But we'll only looked at one image so far. Yeah, it's completely trained, but I'm only looking at one image. So I've got a completely trained network, and I just say for this image, given that you're saying it's an Indian elephant, what about this was most important in determining it's an Indian elephant? Or African, maybe you're right, I don't know. Does, it, does, does what we're looking for make sense? How we do it is not obvious for sure. But neural network, what matters the most in this image in making the determination you made? That could also be useful for errors. Like, you know, it determines that a umbrella is a golf club. What were you looking at that made you think it was a golf club? can also be useful, a, a, a perhaps apocryphal story was that many years ago, the army commissioned some image recognition to try and determine, and I'm getting it probably wrong here, but basically to try and determine was maybe tanks versus jeeps or something, okay? I'm not gonna draw them because I can't draw either one of them, but tanks versus jeeps, and so, it fed in all these images. Well, it wasn't a neural network. It was handcrafted stuff. But in any case, it learned. And you could see, look, I've got all my test images and my validation images, and it can distinguish the tanks from the Jeeps. And they put it out in the real world, and it like, doesn't work at all. And the reason is, all the pictures of tanks were like in a forest. And all the pictures of Jeeps were in a desert. And so you had a picture of, maybe I can do a Jeep. Yeah, there's a Jeep. Um, <laughs> And so what it looked at was, oh, you know, look at all this sand here. That's what I'm using to determine. I don't care about this, right? What's this? Right? I care about the sand. That's the Jeep type image because it's sand. And the, similarly, it looked for green stuff and determined that was a tank. Okay? So this would be useful if we could feed this into the machine learning model and say, what were you using to determine this? And when we saw, oh, I don't give a shit about Jeep part of it. I care about like the sand, you would know, whoa, something's wrong here, right? Okay, so let's try and figure out how we can do this. Let's zoom in and not say this entire area here. Let's look at that pixel, all right? And let's try and determine, is that pixel important in determining that this is an elephant, all right? So we've got our image here, and we care about that pixel. And it's going into our neural net, 
And out of this neural net, because it's image net, is a thousand classes, right? And one of them happens to be elephant or Indian elephant. So this is the one that we feed in this image that's up on the screen, and it says, this is the biggest one, all right? We could look at this before or after the softmax. It doesn't really matter, right? If it's before the softmax, this is absolutely a very large number. If it's after the softmax, it's a number between 0 and 1, but larger than the others. What would it mean to say this is an unimportant pixel? Morgan. If you get rid of it. So if we set it, get rid of it is sort of a hard thing, but I like that. It wouldn't change the prediction. In fact, let's say instead of getting rid of it, we tweak it. Okay? We make it a little more, right, this has an RGB value. Let's make it a little more green. Okay? So we'll just tweak the green a little bit. What happens to this value? Okay, so we're curious about this value. We're going to call this uh, I don't know. Let's see. I want to have it before the activation, so I'm going to call it Z sub elephant. All right. So if we make this a little redder, what happens to this output? Does it change much? Would we think? Probably not. If we make it a little greener, does it change this much? Probably not. If we make it a little bluer, probably not. If we pick a pixel in here, and remember it's not red in the real one, right? This is the heat map that's causing it to red. But if we take a pixel in here and change it, Will it have an effect on this z value? Probably more than if it's down in the grass, down in the weeds, right? So the stuff that is, makes it an elephant is probably going to affect the decision of elephantness more than the stuff that is not really have much to do with being an elephant. Does that concept make sense? Basically, just saying that the partial change in the prediction you have based on. It's uh, exactly what we look at. So, if we say pixel uh, plus epsilon, if that causes the ZE to change a lot, this is an important pixel. And if it changes a little, unimportant pixel. So a little, unimportant. And the nifty thing is we have very nice machinery. That is a partial derivative of z sub e. Right? That is the output of this particular node before we do the softmax with respect to a particular pixel. Okay. We could look at a particular red component of the pixel, or a green component, or a blue component, or we could view it just sort of as a vector. Can we compute this? How? Oh. How can we compute? Partial derivative of z sub e with respect to the partial derivative of the pixel. Or sorry, with respect to the pixel. Give me two words that fit in here. Do you want to buy a vowel? Backward propagation. Back propagation. So we will basically say, because that's what back propagation does, right? Is it calculates the partial derivative. 
So it'll go from here to here, all the way through here, all the way through here, all the way through here, and then all of a sudden we're going to do something we never did before. We never went back to the original input, right? We always did partial derivatives with respect to the weights or the biases. Now we're going to just say, we'll just, we, we already have the partial derivative with respect to these activations. It's easy to take one step back. Right? So for this particular image, what's the partial derivative? For every one of the pixels. All right. So what do we want to do with that partial derivative? Let's again decide which pixels are important. Nick? Larger partial derivatives. Because the larger partial derivative says if we increase the red or green or blue, it will increase the output of that elephantness activation. What if it decreases a lot? Still important? Yeah. It's like if we make it more green or less green and it's still changing, whether it's elephantness, that means it's important, right? That pixel is important. But if we try and shift it and nothing really much happens, unimportant. So that's what we'll do. We'll take the absolute value of this. And this is going to actually give us a vector, right? Because our pixel is a vector, red, green, and blue. Let's just take the, the, the max of those. So that'll tell us that if any one of the color values matters, we'll just say the pixel matters. Okay? Yeah. For any one of the individual color values? Um, so, guess. right, each pixel has three values, three values R, G, and B. And so if the red changes or the green, if the red matters or the green matters or the blue matters, we'll say the pixel matters. It may very well be that for a given pixel, we don't really care about the blue value. But if the red value matters, we're going to say that matters for elephantness. The heat map to be similar for pictures on the same way. Similar in what like distribution way? Uh, no. We're going to have to norm. In fact, what are the range of these numbers coming out of here? The max, the absolute value of the partial derivative of this. Well, actually, we, can, we know one part about it, that it's the absolute value, right? So we have a lower bound on it. That we're somewhere between 0 to. Do we have an upper bound? Is it like 255? Because those are pixel values we have between 0 and 255? No. It's like some, somewhere could be really, really big. We don't know. So we're going to have to scale this sucker if we want to turn it into something that we can see. right? So we can basically normalize all the, the, the partial derivatives. actually the max of the absolute value of the partial derivatives. So we've got some basically distribution of all the pixels. Some of them are smaller than others. Those are the unimportant ones. Some of them are bigger. Those are the important ones. We'll normalize these. We don't really know what the distribution is. We'll just use, uh, let's say, a mean of, I don't know, 128, assuming that uh, we're talking about pixel values from 0 to 255, and we'll use maybe a standard deviation of, I don't know, 64 or something. So we, we can represent two standard deviations below to two standard deviations above. So that's how we'll figure out how we can actually display our heat map. Yeah. Is this just all detection? Like, like actually putting a box on the thing? No. All right. This leads us 
into an interesting concept. Any questions on this first, though? So the basic idea is backpropagate to not the weights, backpropagate to your image, backpropagate to your X, and see how changes to your X would affect your output. All right. This can be used for evil. So how many of you have seen you can take a stop sign and in the wild, you can go ahead and let's say add some modifications to it. Like that. If you saw that out in the wild, you saw a stop sign and you had three colored things on it, what would you think? I mean, someone has defaced my stop sign. But what do you think it is? Like if I ask you, what is this thing? Is it an is it a African elephant? No, it's a stop sign. OK. What if I told you a neural network thinks this is a 55 mile an hour speed limit sign? And that's what it can do. So these are adjustments you can make to the inputs of images, small adjustments that we don't think make a difference that change how it gets classified. And this example is bad because it's things you can do to things in the real world. And like, who might be looking at this? Your Tesla, right? Looking to see, oh wait, I don't, 55, let me step on the gas, right? Which is not really the right result you want. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at trying to convert one thing to another thing. Let's say we have an image. You know, happy face. It goes through our neural network and out comes. Let's not do happy face. Let's do this is a Siberian Husky. Not to be confused with an Eskimo something or other, right? So this is Eskimo. Was it just come dog? Yeah, I think it was. All right. So we've got a trained neural network. We have access to the neural network. We know it's predicting a Siberian Husky. Here's our input that is a, looks just like a Siberian Husky. We want to change this so that instead it outputs teapot. So this is our desired label as an adversary. And this is our actual label. Right. Now, there's one way we could do this. We could take this picture, we could erase it, we could draw a teapot. Yes, it's now an image that is recognized as a teapot. But what does it look like to you and me? A teapot. We want it to look like a Siberian Husky and actually get recognized as a teapot. Can you like, train on a teapot first, find so you could try and kind of find what is a good teapot looking thing and inject it into here. And that injection is a good idea. What we're going to actually do is we're going to take our Siberian Husky and we're going to add on some noise. Okay? Some noise that to you and me can't really tell the difference. We're going to change some pixels here and there. And this is what we're going to feed into our neural network. And it's going to come out with that, right? So if we take the purple line, it comes out as a teapot. So it's really pretty simple. Jack? 
you could overlay limited with TFOP, but this whole like, so the way you are looking at doing it is kind of like traditional um, vision detection works. Is like figure out how to do stuff, and we don't want to figure out how to do stuff. We want to let the network figure it out for us. Um, Mo. Kind of, but there's no need to train any neural network because we already have a neural net. We already know the neural network that we're trying to fool. So that is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to basically say, what is the output of the teapot network, right? So this is going to be Z sub teapot. We know right now Z sub husky is much, much greater than z sub teapot, right? And we want to change it so z sub teapot gets bigger than anything else. So what is the partial derivative of z sub teapot with respect to some particular noise pixel? We don't need a neural network. All we need to do is do backpropagation, find what would be a good way to adjust this noise. For this pixel, would it be good to like increase or decrease? Right? Because we're going to take the sum of these together. That's the, the, the effective x coming in. So basically, we've got this x at this pixel. If we want it, what would make it more teapotish for this pixel? What would make this pixel more teapotish? This pixel more teapotish? This pixel more teapotish for all of them? And then we'll just slightly adjust this image, which is really this image plus this noise, to be more teapotish. And then we'll do it again and again and again. How many times we have to go through? I don't know. We'll have to see. What are we going to use for our update mechanism here? I'm not sure. Like we're going to have a gradient. How much of the gradient are we going to move? Like that's a learning rate. We'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Could you use this to make like a really, really good data augmentation? So basically do that and adjust the Siberian Husky to where you think the neural network sees the teapot, but we know we would see a Siberian Husky, and then essentially label, give that image a label. Yeah, so like this is, basically this is a defense against adversaries, adversarial examples, which is generate your own adversarial examples, label them right, and feed them into the network. But the problem is there's still just a huge domain of input space it's still wide open for this. Um, that could be, so there's no real, that helps, but it's, it doesn't really solve it, okay? There's a little bit more we have to do. So we need to make sure that as it's making this more teapotish, it still looks like a Siberian Husky to us. Okay? So if we call this noise, uh, we're gonna start out with, with no noise, right? It's gonna be completely blank, and we're gonna start just adding noise. We wanna make sure that the noise is not too big. So we want to make sure kind of that the noise is small. And in fact, let's just come up with what's our loss function. Our loss function is well if the noise is big, that's bad. And we're going to have some constant here. Uh, we always use, we won't use lambda, we'll use some beta here, right? Some um, factor for how much we want the noise. And what's the other thing we want it to be? We want it to be teapotish, right? So we want, see if we look at this right. We want z some teapot to be big. That is, if z sub teapot is the smaller it is, the larger the loss. So we're going to have to do some slight manipulation of this, right, to basically make, well, I guess we could just do that. 
So as the teapot output gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the loss gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That would work, right? And so now, what do we have? We have a loss function. We know the weights. We know the parameters we need to update. Are we updating any of the neural network parameters? No. These aren't the things we're trying to learn. What are we trying to learn? This here. Okay? And we will then just take this sum and feed that into the network. We know it's going to look like a Siberian Husky because this noise is all going to be very small, small magnitudes, right? If you add one or subtract one randomly to every pixel, you can't tell the difference, right? If you have a, a magnitude of 255. Questions? All right. So you could do that. You could actually feed in a pre-noise layer and do that. It would effectively be identical. It's really exactly the same thing we're doing. We're taking this, we're adding some noise, and then we're feeding into here. So it is virtually the same. It might be that in the particular um, framework you're using, that might be easier to do that way because you might have to have a little more custom code to be doing this gradients here. But the fact is, any framework you're using has this ability to compute gradients between two different things. And so that's what you do. See you guys. Oh, we have homework. Let me just hand that out. It's uh, almost up on the website. I don't have it up quite yet. But I'll put it up while I'm in the cafe. Have a very good weekend. And assignment four is due tomorrow, 11 p.m. Yes? All right. This code is not, so this code is on GitHub, but it's not in my repository. It's in uh, F. Cholette, his repository. And you can see it. I didn't, have I, I didn't have time to convert it and actually make it runnable. So I'm just using the pre, the output that's already there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put a link to that on the uh, slides. Give you a help. I think it's include top. It's one of the parameters. Did you look at the documentation for the VGD 16? There should be a constructor for VGD16. Okay. Did you see that? I might have missed that. OK. Um, Take. I can, uh, well, I don't know if you want to. You're going to be down there? Yeah. We're gonna, we'll, we can just look at that there.